So for our second to last Civ stream for this year, we had quite a shocking announcement, and that was that Potato McWhiskey would be appearing with all of his spuddy glory. What um, do you mean so by that? Trying to make that come out um, too wrong, but it's interesting because there has never really been a prominent Civ YouTuber on the Civ Strix or Fraxis streaming channel, so that is interesting in of itself. And then also there is some cool implications, I think, with many of the abilities. I definitely at least for two of the three leaders, believe that there is going to be a lot more um, for Civ 7 with the direction that the developers are taking with the game, um, that there's going to be a lot more just interesting gameplay interactions from seeing the leaders. And I want to break them down as quickly as possible um, just for the sake of brevity. So let's get into that, talk about the stream a little bit and some of the hints um, about the leaders as well as their abilities. So I just want to dive into that and get to the meat of the stream. Theodora will be the first alternative and I assume only leader for Byzantium and the devs introduced her almost as a pacifist leader which is funny to think about because Byzantium is wholly militaristic so her ability is very thematic I think with her role pursuing more diplomatic ties and relations as well as managing the court because there are cultural bonuses and faith bonuses intertwined with her base kit which goes well uh, in my opinion because it's very hard to create a leader um, with an alternative playstyle that is not wholly militaristic again, um, with Byzantium's just heavily, heavily um, unit-based, almost industrial aspect. So um, with the Ipodrome, I think it was hard to balance around that, but they presented the ability Metanoia as that. Holy sites provide culture equal to their adjacency bonus, and farms provide a faith adjacency to Ipodromes and holy sites. Furthermore, her leader agenda, the New Rome, uh, has her liking civilizations with high culture output, and then disliking civilizations with low culture output. So fairly straightforward for her agenda. However, her leader ability opens up a lot of pathways, I think, for Byzantium um, that you would not otherwise think of. I think Germany also strays to this path. I'll get into them a little bit. But basically, the culture for Byzantium is going to be largely generated by those farm bonuses. Um, the holy site is going to be hugely impactful, not only because it meshes well with Byzantium's base kit, but because farms are very, very easy to build and getting a plus six faith bonus, if you manage to grab something like work, work ethic, which is industrial um, bonuses or production, I should say it more plainly, um, on top of faith provided with that extra culture bonus, that is plus six culture, plus six faith, and plus six production quite easily. And then if you double that, all of those adjacency bonuses with the holy site adjacency policy card, that is a huge, huge even here on stream, you can see just how easy it is to accrue those bonuses over time. And while you will be investing initially in those builders, it'll be at least two builders if you don't have any bonuses towards their charges to get that plus six adjacency bonus. It is going to come in handy, definitely, since only three farms is plus three, and then you get that double adjacency bonus on top of that. That is an easy six production and six culture. So with Byzantium's bonuses towards rushing religion early and the synergy with the Ipodrome, I think this will make Byzantium a very, very powerful early to mid game sieve as they're setting that up and then carrying on with a strong late game when they go down the tourism route, which I think is almost a no brainer. Um, preferably, you would conquer a few sieves to set up a good base for your industry and your science output and then uh, capitalize on that culture output just by spamming uh, cities uh, with holy sites, which you will need to do since there's only one holy site per city. So I think in turn, um, not to go on too much of a tangent, but I think in turn, um, that's going to be very, very productive overall um, in just ensuring a very, very strong Byzantium with faith, culture, and potentially production if you manage to grab that early religion. Something that a few people may not be considering is that the Ipodrome does still, for uh, Theodora, as far as I'm aware, uh, provide a free heavy cavalry unit. And one way you might not think of using this, but at least I use it in some of my games um, for many different civs, is using that additional movement bonus for the Ipodrome as they are cavalry, they naturally have a higher, higher movement speed to annihilate and disperse foreign apostles and missionaries and create a more stable environment for your religion to spread. If you are going for something like a religious victory, it makes sense too if you don't want to go for the standard tourism victory because that faith bonus is going to stack um, quite well with the uh, Ipodrome. So Theodora is, I think, in my opinion, a lot more balanced than Basile the second in terms of where she can go with her uh, victories. I think the only thing that she is de-incentivized from is the science victory um, and possibly the diplomatic victory. But with that religion, um, I think 
her ties overall um, to the various paths are much, much stronger. Now, when Yong II, I mean Sejong of the Joseon dynasty, I should say, um, he looks really similar though, especially with the drip. Um, however, one thing that does not make sense, or at least I don't think uh, Sejong bears any similarity to Yong Le in this aspect, is the ability, because when I first saw this ability, I was quite confused, not only because it was incredibly basic, um, this late into the development phase for Civ 6, we've already seen some basic abilities with the leader pass, um, like with Nzinga, but this kind of caught me by surprise, just because, I'll just read it to you guys, um, when the first technology from a new era is completed, you receive culture equal to double the science per turn, um, which is very, very basic. If you were going to go with this ability, I would think you would at least get some kind of unique unit or unique district. Um, you already have the Seawan with Korea, so I guess that wouldn't make the most sense. But something unique, um, something that defines Korea, um, Hangul, while it is interesting, this ability itself doesn't seem to relate too much to the invention of the standard Korean writing system. And furthermore, I mean, you don't do anything with this, this ability. I don't know what else I'm supposed to say about it. Um, this is one of the most poorly designed abilities, I think, in the game. Um, while it is strong, potentially, you are basically incentivized to go pure science. There are no alternative paths open for you. And I think Sonduk, or Sundog, Sunduk, um, as much as the Korean fan base for Civ 6, no matter how small it is, seems to passionately hate her, I do think she provides a better angle um, with culture. I mean, if you were going to go with another alternative leader, I would hope it would be like um, the previous leader we talked about, Theodora, where you go with faith or culture or provide an alternative victory path, um, which would make sense with Sejong, you go down faith or production, do something with gold or writing, but that does not seem to be the case here. I mean, it was quite telling even on the stream because they did not have anything to talk about. Um, I kind of feel bad for Ian or Potato McWhiskey here because um, he probably did not know ahead of time just how basic uh, Sejong's ability is. And as much as I like his design and Korea's base kit, the Seowon is incredibly powerful. And I think I can kind of get a sense of where the devs were going with this and not wanting to overtune uh, Korea like they did with Sonduk. I still feel that they could have put a lot more effort into this. They could have given something like free writing, have something interact with um, unique traditions, or when you're researching policy cards, maybe give him a free wild card policy slot at writing, um, make the ability tie in more to the actual um, ability name. But it's just incredibly basic. I don't want to prattle on for too much. I just feel this was incredibly poor in taste and a bit tone deaf. Um, but I mean, I'm not going to riot over it. I don't think there's much they can do now um, to kind of retroactively fix that. However, with Sunduk's base kit, I think her bonuses towards governorship is just more interesting with how you place your governors. And the science and culture is just overall much stronger and fits better um, with Korea's focus on balancing culture and science to get a very strong science victory. Step aside, Napoleon. A new short king is coming to the Civ franchise, and that is Ludwig II. I think he saved the stream because his ability is very interesting. I'll put it plainly here. It is good for giving Germany another path. I think everyone but Sejong in the stream has gone well above and beyond in giving older civs um, more attention to detail and fleshing them out. I think that's one of the primary functions of alternative leaders. You want to play them because they are new and enticing and offer a different angle to tackle a civ. I'm not going to harp on about it too much, but that is one of the reasons why I think people bought, or if they haven't bought, are playing the leader pass in the first place. And his ability, Swang King, reflects that. Wonders, even unfinished, receive a plus two culture bonus from each adjacent district. And then all culture adjacency bonuses provide tourism after discovering ca uh, castles. Very, very useful. Very relevant to Germany's district stacking. Uh, focus in the first place with the Hansa and commercial districts. Those river tiles are going to be even crazier um, with another focus on uh, wonders. So Germany, I think its biggest problem now is going to be finding more time um, between the ancient classical and medieval era to set up their base um, to decide what wonders they want to tackle because you are going to need put a lot of production forward, which to be fair, Germany's base kit helps with um, in building those unique wonders and whatnot to get that culture victory, if you if you so desire. So as you can see on stream, uh, Ludwig is rocking those beautiful Greek or now Bavarian uh, blue and white colors. And you can see they have a respectable zone of Hansa's uh, theater squares and wonders going on. You're going to need to pay very close attention to city placement with this, um, because again, commercial hubs and industrial zones are going to have to also 
um, make use of the wonders and their adjacency bonuses. However, I think this is very, very powerful um, just because that culture is going to also reflect with the tourism bonuses. And this, the devs noted in the stream, applies to all culture bonuses. So if you're theming this also with holy sites or another district that passively provides culture, they get additional tourism on top of that. If you want to go with relics and go down the religious route, that is not a bad idea at all. And in fact, it would make Germany a very, very well-rounded civs in all aspects, perhaps except for science. To be completely transparent, Germany's base game kit is quite basic. Um, there's no other way to spin it. You get one additional district um, than the pop limit, and that is it. The U-boat comes late. It is not a great unit, considering naval units are already underpowered and something that comes far later um, after the industrial era. Also, being a naval unit is laughable. Unless you're playing on an island's map, I don't think you're going to be getting too much mileage out of that. However, uh, I think this synergizes quite well. Um, also, just on top, um, if you're going to compare Frederick Barbarossa, the current um, base game leader for Germany, that combat bonus, even if it's a good plus seven combat strength towards city states and even an extra military policy card slot, um, it's aged. I think other leaders have far stronger abilities, Ludwig included. And there's very little reason, I think, right now to play um, Barbarossa over Ludwig unless you are going for a heavy domination victory. Um, you want to be a historically accurate um, Germany. Maybe you lose a few world wars in between, but um, I think Frederick Barbarossa is safely obsolete. So if they want to rework his base kit, that would be perfectly fine with me. But I think for now, Ludwig's wonder implications with his district theming, um, as long as you get those rivers, is going to be not only powerful, um, but diverse and a just consistently solid A or even S tier sieve if you get the right start. That's going to be it for today's coverage. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any suggestions or comments of how you like the video, just some general feedback, I really appreciate it. Again, the past few months or even the past year has been crazy with the new Civ 6 speculation. I really did not expect them to release anything like this. So great to see one last breath of fresh air um, imbued with Civ 6. I hope Civ 7 is even more spectacular. Um, but thank you guys so much for staying with me in this journey. And I hope to continue it with you guys for the next pack release. All right. Love you guys. Peace.